When I was in the sixth grade, there was a popular series of children's books titled Choose Your Own Adventure. Any of you remember these? In case you're unfamiliar with this brilliant concept, allow me to explain. Choose Your Own Adventure is a series of children's books where each story is written from a second-person point of view with the reader assuming the role of the protagonist and making choices at each juncture to determine the main character's actions and thus the plot's outcome. It does what it says it does. You decide the story. I loved these books, and when I had finished reading through one possibility of threads, I would flip again to the start to begin a new adventure with new outcomes. It was such a great idea that I've often wondered how it would work for sermons. It might go something like this. If you were to prefer to hear a sermon based on Genesis and the story of creation, turn to page two in your bulletins and raise your hand. Anybody? I got like one half of one back there. Okay, Brian wants to do a sermon on Genesis. Okay, if you're not into Adam and Eve and all the animals, there's also the option of Hebrews, that confusing little bit about Jesus being a little lower than the angels. Anyone interested in the epistle? One. Y'all just don't want any sermon, I think is what it is. Okay, two. <laughs> well, if neither of those sound all that interesting, perhaps we could just skip the Sunday lectionaries and go back to last week, to St. Francis and the blessing of the animals, and talk about St. Francis and Brother Sun, Sister Moon, Brother Wolf. Anybody want to just skip all this and go straight for the animals and Francis? Yeah, I loved it Wednesday. It's so good. And last, but certainly not least, we have the heartwarming topic of infidelity, hardness of heart, and divorce from our gospel reading. To lighten it all up, there's even that little bit about blessing the children thrown at the end, in case we've gotten a bit uncomfortable. Any takers for the test given to Jesus about divorce? I actually saw a hand rise. <laughs> that was impressive. Well, I'm not sure that we, we can avoid the elephant in the readings this morning. To hear these readings in public is enough to make the Pope squirm. So hold on to your pews, and let's go ahead and talk about it. One of those choose-your-own-adventure stories I remember reading when I was in the sixth grade was called The Worst Day of Your Life. I looked it up. The author was Edward Packard. I remember that title because one of the worst days of my life happened in the sixth grade. The weekend had started off well enough. I was excited for school to be out, and my mom had even agreed to let me spend the night with a friend. That typically took some convincing. I returned home on Saturday, more than a little tired from staying up way too late. And I was going up the stairs to my bedroom when my parents called my sister and I over to the couch in the living room. It was a hide hideously faded blue couch that had survived the better part of childhood spills and stains. Under the cushions, one could always find a treasure trove of lost Legos and loose change. Well, my parents sat my sister and I down to tell us that Dad was moving out. My parents were separating. I'm not sure how much really registered after those first few words. In fact, at first I thought they were only kidding but what kind of sick joke would that be? My second thought was that 
I didn't want to be that kid at school that my friends felt sorry for or someone made fun of. You see, my parents had arranged for my sister and I to be away the previous evening so that my dad could move a few things out of the house. It didn't make sense to me then, and it still doesn't completely make sense to me now. I mean, I remember just the previous year, I had gotten in serious trouble when I tried to run away from home. <laughs> A lot of that. I can remember visiting my dad in that little apartment, lonely being forced into family time without the whole family, and having to play Monopoly. To this day, I hate Monopoly. Well, as the months wore on, my parents continued in counseling, and my dad even moved back into the house for a few months to get another shop. A few months later, however, he was gone again, and my parents were filed for divorce. 19 years of marriage, for better or for worse, for rich or for poor, and sickness and health were coming to an end. Now, it has been 30, more than 30 years since that day. And I can tell you, at times, it still hurts. Though most of the emotional scars have healed, every once in a while, when the rain is coming in, the old injuries can still start to ache. Now, I tell you this story, not because I think my story is all that special or unique, but because I doubt there is a single person in this room whose life has not been touched by divorce. Either directly or indirectly, we've all suffered the pain that comes from the territory. Wondering when friends get divorced, do we have to choose sides? Continued exposure to heartache. And sometimes result in the hardening of our hearts as some sort of protective self survival mechanism. And the more that I thought and prayed about the readings this week, the more I felt the danger and the peril in making any, any blanket statements about the Lord. The more danger I also felt in not saying anything at all. I mean, are we just going to ignore it? Now, I doubt anyone here would like to hear yet another moral platitude about the force. Further statistics on the average American household or how to somehow fireproof your marriage. As I recently heard someone wisely remark, instead of saying God won't give you more than you can handle, how would I come over and help with the laundry? Makes sense to me. One of the first things we might notice about this morning's gospel reading is the underlying motivation of the Pharisees. It hardly seems they are approaching Jesus with this question out of a deep pastoral lead. They are not asking Jesus how they might respond to their friend or family member who's gone through a divorce. They are asking that they might test or trap. It would appear that divorce was advice to talk with even then than just now. And their concern is more for the letter of the law than the actual lives that law affects. In other words, it is completely possible to be right, but still lose the heart of it. I find it interesting that Jesus never actually answers their question. He admits that Moses gave his command due to the hardening of our hearts. And then he comes back to the beginning. So when God created the heavens and the earth, when God created us to be in a relationship with one another, 
divorce Jesus acknowledges is simply a symptom of human failure. As he says, what God has joined together, let no human separate. Now, is this a blanket prohibition against divorce? Has this verse has so often been abused or misapplied? Or is it simply a recognition of human frailty and failure? What about abusive or destructive relationships of which we are painfully aware? Should the, should the corollary to Jesus' pronouncement be just as true? What humans wrongly join together that God rightly separate? I cannot tell you whether or when divorce is right or wrong, only that it can be painful. God did not create us to tear one another apart, but to complement one another side by side. And when that doesn't happen, there is suffering and pain. It should come as no great surprise to us that we sometimes fail to live into who we are created to be. And when we do fail, we get hurt and we hurt one another. The wonderful and terrifying thing about love is that it requires vulnerability and trust to thrive. And it is scary to risk being hurt in order to be truly loved. As Alfred Lord Tennyson once said, it is better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. <coughs> the love of God is not limited to those who have remained married, as if God's love is dependent on us having and keeping it all together. And the love of God is not <coughs> always about being right. It is about being in relationship. The forgiveness of God is never something that we deserve or earn. It is given simply because we need it. And like the child, the child that Jesus then places in their very midst, we are embraced and blessed by Jesus. Loved because God has created us to be loved. Whether we speak of illness, disease, whether we speak of death or divorce, there is pain and suffering in this life. But that is not all that there is to the story. As we choose new adventures, Forgiveness, love, and healing. The narrative is up to us. <laughs>